Good afternoon, everyone. If you would, please take your songbook and stand. And as promised, let us sing, There Shall Be Showers of Blessing. I encourage you to take your songbook, and that way you can sing parts. Song 552, song 552, and let us sing Showers of Blessing. Ready? There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing, sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys, sound of abundance of rain. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, send them upon us, O Lord. Grant to us now a refreshing, come and now honor thy word. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, oh that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing, now as on Jesus we call. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we feel. Amen. Welcome back to church tonight. Hope you are able to get some rest this afternoon that song was making me think of some scripture that the rain falleth on the just and the unjust just talking about the fact that god is good to everybody and uh, so we have a wonderful god let's pray together as we start our service tonight father we're thankful for your goodness to us today we sang about it this morning surely goodness and mercy shall follow me and now we're hearing about mercy drops and showers of blessing and uh, god you are so good to us each and every day and uh, we just want to think back, Lord, about all the things you've done, not only in our personal lives, in our church, our family. God, you're just so very good to us. And we pray tonight that you would receive glory and honor from our, uh, the way we sing, the way we worship you tonight with singing and with listening to the word of God. May it all be done for your honor and for your glory. We love you in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Let's go ahead and continue our song service, song number 219. 219, no other plea. Where let's go ahead and sing that. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor greed. I trust the ever living one, his words for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I On the third verse now, my heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. Let's lift it up on the last one. My great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. I don't 
don't uh, I don't want to belittle the storm and, and what may happen, but uh, I did get a kick out of watching the news this afternoon a little bit. And uh, the news cycle is all committed to this, you know, hurricane uh, news cycle, and so they are looking hard for stories. And so they had Stormwatch on there, and they had the uh, lady on, you know, she was on, on site, and it's not even raining where she's at, and she's interviewing this guy coming out of a grocery store, and I'm like, Stormwatch, what is this? And then they cut to a clip of this gu- ra- uh, gushing water, raging water, right? And it had some, it was water rushing by trees, and I, I look closer, and I'm like, that's in the riverbed. There was not, it wasn't even like flooding on the streets or anything, it was actually in the river where the water's supposed to be. And so I I got a kick out of that where they're so committed to this storyline that they've got to find some clips. And so now who knows how it may get, but uh, I'm glad that I'm still in church no matter what. And uh, I'm here. I'm going to be at work tomorrow. So I'll be at church tonight. Right. Uh, Praise the Lord. I'm glad I'm here. Hope I'm glad you're here as well. Team leaders, there's a meeting for us after the service right in the choir room. So let's uh, don't forget about that. Head right over there. And then we're continuing our awesome August this Thursday. Looking forward to hearing from Pastor Bruce Four, uh, pastor of Victory Baptist Church in Pastor. So Robles, and so he'll be here with us this Thursday. Uh, September is our missions month, and so that'll be our focus for the month. We've done this the last couple of years. Instead of a missions conference, we just kind of commit the whole month to having different missionaries in, and so we're looking forward to that focus. And then King's Kids begins September 13th, so just a couple weeks away on Wednesday for all of the kindergarten through fourth graders. Next Sunday is Round Up Sunday, so we'll remind you our morning service will be as normal, and then after the morning service, we'll head down and have our meal. There will be a mechanical bull here before and after uh, the afternoon service. And after the meal, we'll come back in here and have our afternoon service at 1230. I encourage you to dress Western and uh, uh, get your cowboy and cowgirl outfits out. We'll come uh, with that. There'll be a competition for the best dressed. And then there'll also be a dessert competition. So if you want to uh, bake a dessert or prepare a dessert and enter that into the competition, there'll be different categories for that or, or divisions. And then... Uh, Even if you're not entering in the competition, if you can bring a dessert for us after the meal, and uh, we'll have a good time with that. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our offering this evening. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we can trust you no matter what. Lord, no matter what our finances look like, no matter what our health situation looks like, no matter what uh, storms may come, literal and, and, uh, and figuratively in our life, Lord, we can trust you. And we can put our faith in you, Lord, as we heard uh, this past Thursday from Dr. Getch about uh, faith and trusting you in everything. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to apply these truths to our life, whether we hear from this pulpit uh, on a weekly basis, Lord. And, uh, we hear faithful preaching from your word. Lord, I pray that tonight would be no different and that we would be sensitive to your Holy Spirit uh, leading in our life. Lord, I pray that you'd bless now this offering as we give to you what you've given to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand with me one last time. You know, we've been talking about that rain. Anybody felt that little jolt of earthquake this afternoon? Yeah? Yeah, I thought it was just me. I thought it was my stomach, but uh, man, yeah, it was good. <laughs> All right. Let's not forget, we have that too. We don't have the uh, cycle or whatever. But uh, let's go ahead and uh, turn to song number 340. 340, the old rugged cross. Let's sing now. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I 
I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a. On the third verse now. In the old rugged cross, stained with blood, so did I. Oh, one speeding I see. For it was on that old cross, Jesus suffered. Good singing tonight. I'll cherish the old rugged cross. At last I lay down. I will sing to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday. Good. Lift it up on the last one. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true His shame and reproach gladly bear Then he'll call me someday to my home far away when his glory forever I'll share So I'll cherish the My trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Please be to live a single minute without Jesus in it. But when I look around, I have no place to run. What about His grace? What about how He came? What about the blood He shed on Calvary that washes sin away? of all he's done and how he helps us overcome how could we ever run away what about his grace if you've been in his presence and you found his mercy flow strength from the throne and glory to your wounded soul how could you ever turn your back on jesus when he died to free us ask yourself a simple thing before you go what about his grace what about how he came what about the blood he shed on calvary that washes sin away think of all he's done and how he helps us overcome how could we ever run away what about his grace what about his grace what about how he came 
What about the blood he shed on Calvary? That washed his sin away. Think of all he's done and how he helps us overcome. How could we ever run away? What about his grace? Love that song. Thank you for singing that today. Hey, I was thinking as you're turning to Hosea tonight, Hosea chapter number 10, what is your favorite song? Now, if it's like Elvis or something, don't share that tonight, okay? But uh, I just want to hear from you. What is the favorite song, something we sing at church? Somebody raise your hand or shout out, Mrs. Reynolds, favorite. I'd rather have Jesus. That's a good one. Mrs. Mr. Reese, redeemed in the garden. This fruit. No, I don't like that one. Um, no, I'm just kidding. A wonderful grace, of Jesus. That's a great one, Brother Robinette. To God be the glory. Mrs. Okay, okay, I saw your hand back there. My tribute. Ooh, that's a good one. Anybody else? Favorite song, Brother Schroeder. Did you say "Go Cubs, Go"? Is that what you said? What was it? I Stand Redeemed. All right. Anybody else want to share favorite song? No Other Plea. Sing that one tonight. Nobody else? No favorite songs, huh? Okay. All right. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. Anybody? For the sippy? No? Okay. All right. Hosea chapter number 10. Hosea chapter number 10 in your Bibles. And uh, Hosea is not a book that uh, probably we get too often, but it's a fantastic book. Hosea prophesied around the time, same time as Amos in the Bible, and uh, Micah, when you read Micah, uh, the, he, uh, Hosea and, and Micah were contemporaries, Isaiah and uh, Hosea were contemporaries as well. So when you're reading Isaiah and you see Isaiah talking to Hezekiah, uh, around that same time, Hosea was prophesying. And he was prophesying, Hosea was prophesying in the northern tribe of Israel and uh, <clears throat> uh, with Amos, while Micah and Isaiah prophesied in the southern tribes of Judah. Now, after the tribes were separated, you know that the, the ten tribes separated and two tribes there, uh, of two tribes of Judah, ten of Israel. After that separation, Judah actually had a few good kings. When you read the book of 1st and 2nd Kings, you'll see in there Judah had some good kings. Israel didn't have any good kings. And uh, so they, they, were, they were wicked. And uh, some of the most wicked kings came out of there. And uh, here, here is Hosea prophesying against the children of Israel where God is trying to bring Israel back to himself. And he, he, he even used the Assyrians to capture the northern tribes of Israel for a while. And of course, there's going to be a captivity later on of the Babylon, Babylonian captivity or 70 years uh, of captivity that the children of Israel will go through. But you'll see throughout the prophets that Jesus is just over and over again trying to bring people back and to bring Israel back. Look at Hosea chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Israel is an empty vine. He's not producing any fruit. There's nothing coming out of Israel. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars. According to the goodness of his land, they have made goodly images. So whereas God has blessed them, whereas God has favored them and allowed them to see great blessings, they've used them all. For idolatry, they've used them all for the wrong reasons. Look at verse 2. And here's the phrase I want us to see tonight. Their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. He shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. But their heart is divided. I want to speak on tonight a divided heart. A divided heart. Now tonight is uh, our last night with old Jacob Kubitschek. Where'd you go? Where'd you go, Jacob? Right over here is going to college at Maranatha, studying biblical counseling. He leaves Wednesday, I believe. We've got some other college students leaving here soon. When do you guys leave right here, Riley? When you leave Monday, next Monday. Next Monday? So like not tomorrow, but a week, okay? And then anybody else leaving that we need to announce 
Uh, not like a church member, we're talking about a college student. Like, I'm leaving. No, don't do that, okay? But, uh, all right, if I miss anybody. But pray for these college students, if you would. And uh, Alyssa, at some point, is leaving around here, too. But, but uh, pray for these young people as they leave. And then, uh, I forgot to give this announcement. We're going to pray and get back to the message here. If you need a Roundup Sunday information sheet, there are some extra ones on the floor where you're out there, okay? Father, bless, I pray, this message as we look now about this divided heart that we're seeing here in Scripture. And I pray that you'd help us to glean some things from this and identify if this is us or not. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <clears throat> Here is the children of Israel with a heart, the Bible says, that is divided. On one hand, they were God's people. On one hand, they, were, they, they, they had the, the blessings that Israel got to possess. Israel had the prophets. Israel had the priesthood. Israel had the precepts of God's command. They had the law. They had all of these things. They were richly blessed. And yet still they had a divided heart. On one hand, they were God's people. But on the other hand, Israel is worshiping and serving idols. Idolatry. And so God said they had a divided heart. Now here's the thought for tonight. It's very simple. God doesn't want part of your heart. God doesn't want half of your heart. God wants the whole thing. He wants all of your heart. Amen? Amen. I'm going to keep asking for amens tonight. Uh, he, He wants all of our heart. I remember hearing a story, reading the story, and, and actually watching this happen back in the 2016 Olympics, where da- uh, not David Phelps, Michael Phelps was uh, David Phelps is a singer. Michael Phelps uh, was swimming, and uh, he was competing and trying to earn his record-breaking gold medals. And he was going against a man. I believe his first name was Philip Leclose was his last name, and uh, he, they were competing in the 200 meter breaststroke. And and if you watched. All the articles and the interviews of LaClose getting up to it, he was obsessed with with Michael Phelps. He was obsessed with with beating him and proving that that, he was the world's best and talked a lot of trash about how he was going to beat Michael Phelps and all this kind of stuff. And it was amazing because as you watch them swim in the 200-meter breaststroke, if if, if you keep watching, you'll see that LaClose kept looking at Phelps. Just kept watching him the whole time. And, uh, of course, Phelps was not focused on LaClose. He was focused on the finish line, and Phelps won the gold medal. LaClose didn't even place, and LaClose was actually the favorite in the race. So what happened there? You see, one man's attention was divided. One man was focused on one thing. His eye was single, singular. He, he, he kept his focus straight on, set like a flint, and the other one had his focus divided. He wanted to win, but he really wanted to beat Phelps. And, you know, we, we can't afford as Christians to live with a divided heart, a divided focus, a divided heart where, uh, where partially we serve God and partially we are uh, interested in what the world has to offer. Take your Bible, go to Matthew 22. Now, I did reference this this morning, but it's always good to just go back to Scripture and see what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22, and let's look at verse number 37, Matthew 22, verse 37, of course, Jesus answering a question, and he says here, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, not most, not some, not half, all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is likened to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. Again, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. In in other scripture, all your strength. In other words, everything. Our love for God is not supposed to be something that is split between uh, uh, different Things, the world and Christ. In fact, Jesus said, hey, if you hate not your father and mother and all of that, in comparison, in other words, God, Christ is above, your love for Christ is above all of that. And if you don't have that, hey, something is not quite right. Why do we partake in the Lord's Supper every month? We are trying to uh, make sure our heart is not divided, that we're not holding on to the world, holding on to our sin, and then trying to grab Christ. No, the focus should be always on Christ. 
The first commandment in the Old Testament, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That was the first of the Ten Commandments. Why? Again, God is not suffering a divided heart. Not a divided heart. Take your Bible. Let's go to the Old Testament. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter number 18. 1 Kings chapter number 18 in the Bible. And we're going back 150 years in history before Hosea. So Hosea would have known this story. Everyone in that time would have known this story. And every, most Christians, I would say, know the story of Elijah and Mount Carmel now. Every time I hear Mount Carmel, I get a little hungry, but that's okay. Mount Carmel, imagine if it was, though, a mountain of Carmel. That's where I would have lived, tell you what. All right. 1 Kings chapter 18, look if you would at verse number 20, uh, verse number 17. It came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he said, I have not troubled Israel, but thou, thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. He said, Look, I'm not the one with the divided heart, Ahab. You are. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel into Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And here is what Elijah says to all the people, to Israel, to God's chosen people. Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. So he's saying, hey, if God is God, then don't be divided about that. Follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him. And the people didn't say anything, so they said, let's have a contest to see who is God. And after that, it was very clear. And thankfully, a lot of the people said, okay, we'll serve God. And it always seems to last a short time. But they had a divided heart. And what was Elijah saying? He's saying, stop having this half in, half out dividedness about you and just pick a side. Isn't that what Jesus kind of said in Revelation? I don't want you uh, lukewarm. Choose a side, either be warm or be hot, but don't have this middle of the road dividedness about you. Choose a side. So here we see Hosea, 150 years before that, we see Elijah saying the same thing. Let's go back 585 years. Go back to Exodus chapter 32, if you would, please. Exodus chapter 32 in your Bibles. Exodus chapter number 32. Let's look at this passage quickly here. Exodus 32. <clears throat> See, it seems like Israel always had an idolatry problem. And we tend to think sometimes that it was just in the Bible days that idolatry was an issue. Idolatry has always been an issue. It's just our idols look different than theirs. Look, if you would, at Isaiah, Exodus 32, verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, idolatry, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what's become of him. Moses had gone to the mount to meet with God and receive the Ten Commandments. While he's gone, the people are like, we don't know what happened to this guy. Make us gods. They had been in Egypt for 400 years. They had served Egyptian gods. Probably. They knew all the culture. And Aaron said in them, verse 2, break off the golden... Don't even put up a fight. I just hate that so much. Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your, uh, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in the ears and brought them unto Aaron, and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Incredible idolatry here. Understand what Aaron was even doing. 
Aaron was not saying, hey, the, this golden calf is Baal. This golden calf is the one that saved you. No, what Aaron was doing was saying, this golden calf is Jehovah. That's messed up. That's that's, that's crazy amount of idolatry there, saying this is the God, this is the Jehovah God that, that brought you up out of the land of Israel. This is your God. That is just bringing the people to another place of idolatry. There was a divided heart. What was, what was Aaron thinking? Aaron had seen up close and personal all the works of God. But thankfully, when Moses come down out of the mount, look at the verse, same chapter, look at verse number 25 and 26. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for some reason, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? Who is undivided in their allegiance? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And after that, 3,000 people fell that day. 3,000 men were killed because, hey, they, they were worshiping and serving idols. I wonder today if, if our hearts are divided. Our hearts are divided between the world and what it has to offer, between our job between responsibilities and between God. You see, there is a correct order of things. You can be focused on your family, and you can be a good worker at work and do your job well. You can do all of that and still have God first place. But God has to be first place. Nothing can take the place of God. Anything in your life that elevates itself above your allegiance to God is an idol. Anything that is even equal in your allegiance to God is an idol. And so God will not suffer that. If it's your way versus God's way, it's the world versus the word of God, it's false gods versus the one true God, you have to make a decision. You have to make a choice. Who am I going to serve with my whole heart? Listen, one of the most famous verses in the entire Bible is one man's declaration saying, my heart is not divided. Joshua 24, 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but as for me and my house... We will serve the Lord. That's what we will do. And, I'm, and I, I've got to tell you, I get real sick and tired of the half-in, half-out Christianity. That is not discipleship. The disciples of Jesus Christ weren't in it one day and then out the next. And then, oh, Jesus, I got a thing on Sunday. Oh, Lord, I'll follow you. Oh, you're going over here to, to break the bread and, and to feed 5,000 people. But uh, hold on, I got a game that day. No, th that was not it. And we have neglected and forgotten what true discipleship is. It's a life of sacrifice. It's a life of following Jesus Christ. It's a life of saying everything else is on the outside. Jesus is first. Jesus is first. Not living a divided heart. We will, uh, that's what Joshua was saying. He's saying, I'm not divided. My family's not divided. We're serving God. I don't care what you do. We are serving God. And I wish we had more of that in today's day and age in Christianity of people just saying, I don't care what anybody else does. I'm going to be in church. I don't care what anybody else does. I'm going to serve God. I don't care what anybody else does. We're going to read our Bible. I don't care what anyone else believes. We're going to stick to the truth of the word of God. That's what we need today. I heard a pastor tell an illustration recently. And I think it sums up perfectly what a divided heart looks like. He, he, he's a pastor. A teenager came to him and said, Pastor, what type of music should I listen to? What type of music pleases God? Like, you know, can I listen to contemporary Christian music? What, what kind of, you know, rock and roll, what can I listen to? And he was really trying to prove, like, what he wanted to listen to was okay. And the pastor said, let me ask you a question. If God told you that the only music you could ever listen to for the rest of your life, and the only music that pleased him was polka, 
you know, the little accordion, you know, and all that kind of stuff, and the, and the little drum, you know. If the only music that you could ever listen to was polka music for the rest of your life, if God told you and said, this is what pleases me, listen to that for the rest of your life, would you do it? And the young man said, I don't think so. And the pastor said, that's your problem. Your heart is divided. That's the problem. The problem is you are unwilling, even if God is crystal clear on something, to do what God said to do. That's how we know if our heart has a little division in it. It's when God reveals something and God says something, but we say, I know that's what it says, but I would rather, well, then that's a divided heart. We're saying more than what God commands and what God wants, I would rather choose my way. Don't you see that's a bit of idolatry right there? Because you're saying, I want my way over God's ways. So we, we can all be guilty of having this divided heart. You remember in the Bible, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, there's one thing you cannot do, serve two masters. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and riches, worldly riches. You cannot do it. In James chapter 1, verse 8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Just very quickly tonight, I want to just say three things about having a divided heart. I don't want to have a divided heart. So first of all, I want to encourage you to decide it. Just decide it. I'm not going to have a divided heart. My allegiance will not be divided. No, it is all about Jesus. I love in Psalm 108, David said, Oh God, my heart is fixed. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. We used to say, and this is a phrase that probably everybody's heard, uh, somebody is sitting on the fence about something. They're on the fence about something. I don't know how you grew up, but I grew up, uh, I climbed a lot of fences as a kid. Chain link fences to get into the baseball diamond, whatever it was, you know. Uh, we were climbing fences all the time. Why? Because we could. And because we probably shouldn't. And that's why we were doing it, you know, as a kid. But uh, I climbed a lot of fences. But one thing, you know, you sit on the top of a fence, you got this way and this way. So people would say, get off the fence about it. Make a decision. You know, I want to encourage you, get off the fence about this thing of serving God. Just decide. Just decide. Get off the fence about this thing of growing in, your, in grace and growing in Christ. So just decide, I'm going to do that. Get off the fence when it comes to reading your Bible and praying and walking with God. Get off the fence about Wednesday night and Sunday night. No, I'm going to be there. Let's decide it. Make a decision. No, I'm not going to have a divided heart. Some people seem to just not be able to make any decision because fear paralyzes them. Well, what will other people think? Well, what will they do? Who cares? Don't be divided. Serve the Lord. Well, what if we as parents start implementing this in our family, but we've never done it before, and, and uh, you know, we haven't exactly lived up to that? Decide it. We've had many powwows with our family where we said, kids, we haven't been doing this right as parents. We're sorry, but from now on, here's what we're going to do. Here's how it's going to be. Decide something. By the way, you say, well, I'm not going to decide anything. That's making a decision. Not deciding is deciding too. I like Baskin Robbins. I like Baskin Robbins a lot. And uh, talk about Mount Carmel. Goodness. All right, but... Uh, when we were on the road, we came back Friday from up north. We were at a teen camp all week and preached six times in, in, uh, in the course of those days there. And had, we had a great time. My wife got to teach up there too. We are traveling back and we stopped right before we hit the grapevine, going up to the grapevine. We stopped at a place, just our last restroom break, which we thought it was anyway. And uh, we went into the rest stop there and they had a Baskin Robbins in the rest stop. I can, I can feel the glory coming down when I see Rainbow Sherbert from Baskin Robbins, okay? That is just, it's amazing. Butter pecan, yes. Some like, the, the, what's it called, the, the, the chocolate one, world-class chocolate, whatever, don't get that. Get the butter pecan, get the Reese's, or get the Rainbow Sherbert. Anyway, all right, altar call is open. No, they have 31 flavors. You know one of the hardest things for me to decide? Most things I can decide pretty quickly on. You know, say, Pastor, what do you think about this? I hate it. I love it. Eh, I don't like it. You know, what? I can usually decide on something pretty quick. But when it comes to food, I cannot decide. Because I like everything except for 
sour cream because it's disgusting. But everything, most everything else, I'm like, yes. Pastor, you feel like Mexican food today? <laughs> when do I not feel like Mexican food? Do you feel like Korean food? Of course. Feel like Ameri- I, I love it all. I'm, I'm very easygoing and uh, tolerant of all kinds of food, okay? But, uh, you know, we, we, sometimes we treat serving God like it's Baskin Robbins. Just choose whoever you serve. Choose whatever you, flavor you want. Look, there's really only two choices here, folks. Are you going to serve God or not? Are you going to be all in for Christ or not? We're getting ready to go into the fall, and I'm looking for our people. I want to see growth. I want to see development. I want to see new people reach for the cause of Jesus Christ. I want to see people coming in and getting saved and growing. But we need people who are all in for Christ, all in for Jesus Christ. Not, well, I'll do that. No, no. It's, it's, it, my pastor used to always say, uh, and he quotes from somebody else. I think it was C.T. Studd. Only two options are on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. I love that quote, only two options on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. I want to encourage you to be like Joshua, just decide, hey, as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. As for me and my house, we're going to obey God. Decide it. Secondly, declare it. Declare it. When our troops go to war, they're declaring which country they believe in. They're declaring who they're representing. You know where they stand. You know, I get so tired When I go soul winning in the area of just seeing the hordes of Jehovah's Witnesses out there. Just seeing the masses. And then even even the Mormons. A lot of them have more backbone than we have, and we have the truth. But they have little name tags announcing who they are, what they stand for. I want to encourage you to declare it. Boldly, proudly, not arrogantly, but, but thankfully declare who you serve. Let your family know. Declare it to your family. Hey, from now on, we are serving God. Hey, family, I am a child of God. I serve God. Let your friends know where you stand. Let your neighbors know. And I'm not saying be mean about it, but people ought to know where we stand. So You watch politicians sometimes. No one knows where they stand on issues because they don't want to tell anybody so they get elected. There should never be for us. People should know where we stand. Declare it boldly. That's what Joshua did. That's what Elijah did. Now, I I will say, I've heard the quote, and my wife has said this many times, say what you mean, but don't say it mean. Say what you mean, but don't say it mean. You can declare, hey, I serve God. Hey, I go to church. Hey, come with me to church. You can say it without being mean about your stance. And I think a lot of Christians have failed at this. They have took a stand, but they have been mean and calloused and angry and bitter about it, and that's not the right way to do it. Number one, decide. Decide it. Get rid of the divided heart. Declare it. Hey, you make a vocal decision. You make a vocal uh, 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 announcement of where you stand, and then lastly, do it. Decide it. Declare it. Do it. Don't just say what you're going to do. Do it. Don't just say you serve God. Serve God. Don't just say you believe in church and you believe in the Bible. Go to church and read your Bible. If you've decided it, declare it. If you've declared it, do it. Nike, famous for just do it. I have on my, on my calendar in my office, because I, 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 can, I can become someone who puts things off until the right time. And I don't want to be that. So I, have on, I, I don't have it because of Nike, because... I don't like Nike, to be honest with you. I think they're a bunch of hypocrites. But anyway, um, but I, I have on my calendar, just do it. There's things, there's ideas, there's plans, there's, there's uh, visions that I have for the ministry. And so I just wrote up there, just do it. Just, just do it, you know. And uh, I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's what I have going on up there. I loved years ago uh, watching March Madness uh, in uh, Michigan, the, the, uh, the college team of Michigan in basketball, Every, you know, every year they have different slogans on their shirts at different colleges. And one year, Michigan had this. It said, less words, more work. I was like, man, I like that. Less words, more work. The Bible says, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is a sin. So tonight, simple message. Is your heart divided? Is there something that is drawing you away from Christ? Or would you be able to say, no, I have declared it, I have decided it, and I am following Jesus 
fully with all my heart, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. I'm not going to have idols. I'm deciding, hey, my heart's not divided. No, like David, my heart is fixed on God. It's fixed on God. Father, would you bless, I pray, the message tonight and help us to see that, Lord, you're not interested in half of us, half of our heart. You want all of us, and you deserve all of us. You didn't hold back from us when you died on the cross. And I pray we wouldn't hold back from you. I pray, God, tonight that we would decide it. We're going to serve God. I pray we would declare it. Let people know. Let our, even just announcing it to ourselves. Hey, I'm going to serve God. And then that we do it. That we would decide that you have first place in our lives. And we would live that way. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Music plays. Let's just have you, you can remain where you're at. You can come to the altar if you want. But would you just spend some time and... Is there a divided heart? If you need to come to the altar, you come. If you need to pray where you are, then you pray. Would you just evaluate, is is there a division in your heart? What is it? Or would you be able to say, no, God's got all of me. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Whatever he wants, I'll do. Would you begin to pray? that God would help us to see a harvest of souls saved in this fall? Would you begin to pray for that? That God would just help us to see more of our community reached for the cause of Christ. Father, I'm so grateful for the Word of God. I'm so thankful that you don't let us get by on things, Lord. There's always a convicting, still calm voice reminding us to get back to where we're supposed to be. And I pray tonight, Lord, if some of us have had a bit of a divided heart recently, that we would get back to saying, no, I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. I'm going to love the Lord God with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength. I pray, God, you'd help us to just be Christians that are putting you first always. Thank you so much for being so good to us. Lord, I pray that you bless our college students, uh, some of them leaving this week and the next week. I pray for their protection and safety. I pray that you'd help them to just be used greatly of you and help them to have a great year. We love you. We thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. James and April are back here. We went to college with them, so get by and greet them. But uh, team leaders, we have a meeting in the choir room. I'll see you there in five minutes. And uh, be here Thursday night. Bruce Ford is going to be a great blessing, so I hope you'll be here. God bless you. You're dismissed.